Today is Palm Sunday, also called Passion Sunday. And today we are remembering that our Lord Jesus Christ approached Jerusalem. The message is entitled, The King Approaches. And we see in this text that Christ is approaching Jerusalem as the king in fulfillment of prophecy. In amazing humility, he comes. He comes to fulfill his mission. He comes having been sent by the Father that that those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ would be forgiven because of what he will now accomplish in this last week of his earthly life. What an amazing text it is that we consider this morning. And I want to encourage you to give your attention to the word of God as it's preached now and give your attention to, the, to this preached word, though it be such an unusual format. God in his mercy can use this, this type of circumstance to still encourage his people across the airwaves. I am reminded, though, I have to say, of uh, years ago when I worked in Manhattan, once in a while it might be the case that the children needed to hear from their father Uh, regarding some discipline issue at home and the children were quite young and so I would ask my wife you know honey please put the uh, the phone on speaker and I would address the children and I would say to them in a way you could only say to young children it wouldn't work now but I'd say children you look at this phone when I'm speaking to you and uh, they would indeed look at the phone now they probably wouldn't do it but to the degree you can look to this preached word over the internet and look to your own copy of the word. I was very encouraged um, in working my way through seminary how often Professor Hendricks would say, you're looking up at me, but the answer is in the text. Look at the text. And so I want to point you to the text here, Matthew 21. We may touch on some other texts as we make our way through. But consider what is happening in this text. We see the amazing qualities of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no one like him. No one real or imagined as wonderful as the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him now drawing near to Jerusalem. We see that he's coming. And there are three things I specifically want to show you in the text about our great king as he approaches. Three things I would like to draw your attention to. I want you to behold his intentionality. We see that there in the first four verses, how intentional the Lord Jesus Christ is as he approaches Jerusalem. Also, I want you to behold his humility. No one is humble as our Lord Jesus Christ. We see it in verses 5 through 11, his amazing humility. And then lastly, I want you to behold his power. Being humble does not mean being devoid of power. And his power is so evident there in verses 12 through 17. This is the outline. This is the direction. My goal is that you see him this morning. That you're strengthened by his presence. We have all experienced, I hope, that sense of difficulty in which the presence of one who comes into the situation is reassuring and comforting. There are those who can do what Winston Churchill encouraged, share your strength with others. Keep your fears to yourself. There are many ways that we can help each other. And as you see Christ in this text, if we see him rightly, We are deeply encouraged, greatly comforted, and inspired to worship our great King. That is my goal this morning. The Lord Jesus Christ is the best one to know in a pandemic. There's no one better that you could have a relationship with. He knows what to do. He's the Lord of life and death. His shepherding care is so steady, so constant. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will see us through all the way. He is with us in life and death, in sickness and in health. He will bring us through to the other side where death and sickness are no more. Because of what he accomplishes this last week of his life, his suffering, his crucifixion, his resurrection, 
These have accomplished our redemption. We have eternal life and forgiveness. Praise the Lord. As I mentioned, it's also called Passion Sunday, depending on which part of the church you're from. I know that uh, some of us have come to Milford Bible Church from other parts of the broader body of Christ. And perhaps even you're tuning in this morning, not as a member of our congregation, but having been made aware of this live stream service. And we can certainly praise the Lord for the manifest and manifold representations of the body of Christ around the world. Some more liturgical, some less liturgical. In some churches, the colors on the pulpit have turned to red today because it's Passion Sunday. Having come through a season of the color being purple in mind of Lent and in mind of thinking about the focus, the suffering of Christ, the color turns to red on Passion Sunday because we remember the blood that Jesus shed and that this week is a week indeed so full of suffering. Passion Week comes from the Latin word for suffering. We use the word passion differently. We might say Suffering Sunday or Suffering Week. This is the week we come to as the Lord would have it in the life of the church. On this day we remember him. And it begins with him going up to Jerusalem. This is a message about Christ our King. In this text, we behold his royal grandeur. We see his steadfast, purposeful stride. We marvel at his deep, sincere humility. We are struck by his phenomenal power. And again, in one sense, this is a topical message. It's a message about Palm Sunday, about Christ, about Jerusalem, about the way Christ is received. And we need to see Christ in the midst of this COVID-19 coronavirus crisis. But this is also an expository message. My aim is to faithfully preach this text so that you see the point of the text and you're strengthened by it and edified by it and Christ is glorified in all of that. So let us see first his intentionality. Look at verses one through four. Behold that it says, they drew near to Jerusalem. So much there in that one phrase. They drew near to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the epicenter of Jesus' haters. And yet he's drawing near to Jerusalem. If he's killed, it will be here in Jerusalem. And indeed, he is killed in Jerusalem in less than a week from the events of our text. Shortly before this, his disciples were amazed that he would talk of moving in this direction. John eleven eight 8 says, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Yes, he's going there again. We read in Luke 13, 31, at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, to the Lord Jesus, they said, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem had this reputation. Jesus went on to say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, that stones those that are sent to it. Jesus is not afraid, nor is he aimless. He doesn't run the other way. He's not vacillating or indecisive. He's full of intentionality and purpose. There are things worse than death, like cowardice or faithlessness or not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had already set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. He determinedly and resolutely, deliberately decided to move in this direction. The disciples, having become aware of this, are uh, going with him. And Thomas says in John eleven six, 6, let us also go that we may die with him. 
Now they come, they draw near. We're reminded, I think, of the Apostle Paul, who years later, having become a follower of Christ, is going up to Jerusalem himself, and he's being warned by prophets that what what, what awaits him in Jerusalem is being captured and taken into custody and suffering. And as the prophets are giving him this word, and as he's meeting with the fellow believers who are pleading with him not to go to Jerusalem, Paul gives this beautiful manly response. He says, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready to go to Jerusalem. I'm ready to die, whatever is God's will for me. Men like this are the men that God uses to build the kingdom. Women who are strong in their faith are the women that God uses. And young men, young women, boys and girls who believe in Jesus Christ no matter what is coming. These are the ones that please God. Jesus is pleasing God as he steadily makes his way to Jerusalem. Notice that he sent two disciples, still there in verse 1. Jesus sends two disciples. He has a specific plan in mind. He's a man of action, and he puts his plan into motion. In an age of so many aimless, he is refreshing. He tells them what to do, how to proceed. He even tells them what to do with a certain contingency that might arise. They are to go and find a donkey tied with its colt. They are to untie them and bring them to Jesus. And if someone says, what are you doing? The Lord tells them what to say in that case. And we read in the other gospels, in Mark and in Luke, that's exactly what happened. Those who were standing by said, what are you doing untying that colt? And they they gave the word, the Lord needs them. And indeed, they were let go. They were sent with the donkey and the colt. This is how full of purpose our Lord is and how much his purposefulness gives strength to those around him, to his followers. Notice, too, that this is a fulfilled prophecy. Verse 4 says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. We'll come to the words of the prophet from Zechariah in just a moment, but I want you to think with me about what's happening now. It's true that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in fulfillment of the prophetic word, and yet Jesus in his humanity was not the orchestrator of that event. He was inside the womb of his mother, just like you and I had nothing to do with where we were born. I was born in Boston. I had nothing to do with that. Later I moved to New York and Pennsylvania. I had something to do with those decisions. Jesus is born again from the human perspective. He's God and so he's orchestrating everything. But from a human perspective, he's born in Bethlehem. And that fulfilled the prophecy. But now, at this moment in time, at this moment in history, he makes a move that is designed to fulfill prophecy. He's aware of the scriptures. He knows the scriptures in his divinity and even in his humanity. He is a man of the word of God. He knows this prophecy and he puts in motion a plan to fulfill it. You can think of it like the sword and the stone. When Arthur approaches the stone to remove the sword from it, he's saying, I am the king. I have removed the sword. Or as you, as you may be aware, when Alexander the Great came to the place where there was the Gordian knot and there had been this oracle spoken that the one that can untangle this knot will rule all of Asia. Alexander came and approached and saw this incredibly tangled knot that seemed hopeless for untangling. But the prophecy said if the one who can untangle this knot will rule Asia... And in a moment of real genius that showed who he was, Alexander, according to legend, took his sword and sliced through that knot. And indeed, he went on to rule Asia. So men of action take steps to indicate who they are. Now Jesus is saying, I am the king who approaches Jerusalem on a donkey, on a colt, in humility. Behold his purposefulness. Too many are watching life go by not hearing from God what they should do and proceeding with that kind of purposefulness. Behold his powerful purposefulness, and yet he is so humble. When I lived in Boston, I was often working on architectural plans overnight, and um, 
There was a place that was open all night where you could bring in your plans and make copies. And one of the men from uh, the, our church, the South End Neighborhood Church in Boston, worked there. His name was Henry. And Henry had such a sweet spirit. I remember saying to him this, this night, it was two in the morning, and, and he was there, and I was there. Architects often have to work through the night in what we call charretting. But I said to Henry, you have such a humble spirit, Henry. He replied back to me, Dan, I, I have a lot to be humble about. What a, what a, what a sweet thing to say, and, and isn't it true of each of us? And yet, what does the Lord have to be humble about? What does Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of Israel, the King of the Jews, have to be humble about? But yet he is so humble, so refreshing. In fulfillment of this beautiful prophecy in Zechariah, he comes humble. Verse 5 says, quoting Zechariah, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. What a sweet thing. He comes in such a humble manner. Let there be no doubt. This is intentionally very humble. This is a donkey. This is a beast of burden. Not even a full-size, full-grown donkey. No one can tell Jesus to get off his high horse. He's not on a high horse. He's on a a young donkey, a colt, a foal. I think if we could picture it, probably his feet are almost dragging the ground. It is a humbling circumstance. He's on a lowly donkey. World leaders like to travel in style, don't they? You have seen, I'm sure, that impressive aircraft, Air Force One, when President Trump is traveling around the world. Very impressive. Or for more local travel, Marine One, and as he travels, the uh, Marines snap to attention and, and, and greet the president with a salute. And when he's on the ground, he travels in a limousine that's nicknamed, oddly enough, the Beast. In fact, that limousine, I believe, travels with him within Air Force One. It, there was a lot of excitement recently at Daytona this year before we uh, were in the midst of this unfolding crisis because President Trump was the host or the... Um, the one sort of overseeing the, the, the uh, festivities there at Daytona. And he drove this vehicle on the ra- that famous racetrack. The beast is hard to conceive of, but it's basically tank meets luxury hotel. That's one way to think about the beast, the president's official limousine. It has eight-inch thick armor, five-layer polycarbonate windows that can withstand armor-piercing rounds. That's the glass night vision cameras, grenade launchers. It's a sealed environment with oxygen. You can withstand chemical attacks inside the beast. There's even a blood supply with his blood stored in this vehicle. What an amazing way to travel. What a ride. That's how he rolls. Who is greater, President Trump or Jesus Christ? I I don't want to ask the president that question. I don't want him to get it wrong. But, but Jesus is greater. Jesus is the son of God. He is the king of kings. And who is more humble? Here he comes, the, the great king of kings, riding a beast of burden. Take note as well that this is a borrowed donkey. Jesus owns the clothes on his back. Even those he will lose before the week is out. He doesn't own a donkey or even a colt, a foal. It's a very humbling circumstance. I've recently been in the situation where I needed to borrow from one of our uh, church members a, a trailer to, to move some things. I don't have my own trailer, and uh, my friends were very gracious to allow me to borrow their trailer and, and make that a beast of burden to accomplish my purposes. Jesus is borrowing a donkey. Notice, too, there's no saddle. If you read the Old Testament, so many times we see people traveling on donkeys. We have the famous account of Balaam who's traveling on his donkey and actually hears back from his donkey in this amazing text back in the Old Testament. But each one who travels on a donkey saddles their donkey. They're traveling on a saddled donkey. There's no saddle for Jesus as he 
mounts this donkey. The disciples and perhaps others are putting their cloaks on the donkey. Very, very humble act. For the part of the people, there's a way that they're receiving him. They're putting cloaks on the donkey, cloaks on the ground. They're they're gathering palm branches and putting those on the road and waving those and hailing him as king. They're doing what they can, these humble people who are with Jesus on the road. Such a humble act. Now, some scholars have said, well, this is normal for kings. It's normal for kings to travel into the city like this. But the text itself is saying This is an act of humility, that he's humble, mounted on a donkey. Yes, Solomon rode David's mule when he became king, but this is a very different circumstance. Behold his humility. This is consistent for the Lord Jesus. Those of you who know him, you know this about him. He's so humble. He's so gracious. He's so gentle. We know him this way. We think about what Paul tells us over in Philippians chapter 2 as he reminds us in such a powerful way of the humility of the Lord Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 2 verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Amazing to think about our Lord Jesus. It is such a rebuke to our arrogance, such a rebuke to our self-centeredness, And in his mercy, the humility of Christ is helping us walk away from sin and pride and follow him in humility. Jesus is not insecure. He's not proud. He's very humble, very gentle. He's approachable. Come to him, sinner. Jesus stands and beckons you, come. He reminds us of another president uh, from history from more humble times. Um, He has a yes face, we might say, as Chuck Swindoll has uh, related this account. During Thomas Jefferson's presidency, um, Jefferson and a group of travelers were crossing a river that had overflowed its banks. Each man crossed on horseback, fighting for his life. A lone traveler watched the group traverse the treacherous river and then asked President Jefferson to take him across. The president agreed without hesitation. The man climbed on and The two made it safely to the other side of the river where somebody asked the traveler, why did you select the president to ask this favor? The man was shocked, admitting he had no idea it was the president of the United States who had carried him safely across. All I know, he said, is that on some of your faces was written the answer no, and on some of them was the answer yes. His was a yes face. This is Jesus. He is welcoming. He is encouraging. Children come to him. Doesn't it bother you? Doesn't it bother me that as people become successful in life, and whether it's financial matters or in the sports world or in music, too often they're too busy for children. They're too busy for the humble, the the little people, the small ones. Jesus welcomes us. Jesus welcomes children, welcomes the poor. And he gladly receives their praise. He's such a humble individual, such a humble king. How unusual. What's striking is that Jesus can affirm his own humility in a way that really only he could. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light he is so humble and yet he is so powerful let us consider our third point behold his power we see it there in verses 12 through 17 we see the power of our Lord Jesus As he enters the temple, 
We see what he does. He drives out the money changers. It's good to be aware that being, hum- being humble, being a person marked by humility and meekness and gentleness does not mean that we are relegated to the world of complaining and never doing. The humble can be very decisive. The humble can be very bold in their actions even. And Jesus, in his humility, is still quite powerful in what he does now. He drives out the money changers. We see that in verse 12. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Look at this power. Now, he truly drove them out. He wasn't just complaining. When he finishes, they're gone. They're gone. So when Jesus enters the temple, here are these money changers, these crooks, these robbers. But when he's finished, they're gone. He has driven them out. He will not silently witness this mockery of God. Imagine being there and witnessing this. Jesus cares about this house of prayer. And I want to encourage all of us, in these difficult times when we are, by virtue of this pandemic, in a situation where we connect through the internet, we connect through various means that are available to us, this is still the church of the living God. And this is a temporary means. It's not a substitution for being gathered here in this place of worship, this sanctuary. It's not a substitution for gathering in the prayer room. It is a temporary means, and the church of the living God is amazing. We will find over time, and and you've found if you've been in the Lord a long time, that sometimes the church will disappoint us. That's true. Sometimes the men and women that, that are part of the church aren't what they should be. But Jesus is what he should be, and the church still has this lofty goal. Don't settle for less with the church. Jesus doesn't settle for the temple having become a den of robbers. It's a temporary circumstance, the temple. Really, it's something that's pointing to him as a way to meet with God. But he will not sit idly by. He will not be a complainer. He's a man of action. He cares about this house of prayer. It mattered to him. And now let me say this, don't test him. Don't love your sin in a way that's mocking God, as if God doesn't see, as if God isn't going to one day judge. Oh, sinner, turn from sin. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, the one who suffered and died on that cross, who shed his blood that your sins might be forgiven, that was buried. He rose again from the dead. All who turn from sin and put their faith in him are forgiven. Turn to him. See that he is one who doesn't think lightly of sin. But let me say another word before we get carried away, before we decide we're going to clean house everywhere we go. Realize that you and I are usually the problem. Usually it's you and me from whom the wickedness needs to be driven out. We too often make a mockery of God. It was a sweet moment just a few weeks ago. uh, My son Sam invited a friend from work over to the house and we were enjoying a wonderful meal together with this man. And he looked around the table and said, wow, you have have a really amazing family here. And in a, a pure moment of honesty, I said, well, Mike, you're here on a good day because it's not always like this. Yes, the grace of God is active in our home and yes, we want that. But oh, my flesh is ever too present And I thank God for the the times where his word subdues that. So mostly as we drive out the wicked, we must start in the mirror and let the word of God and prayer and the body of Christ be useful to us in driving out the wickedness of our own souls. Behold also the power of Jesus Christ when it comes to the blind and the lame. The very interesting phrase, I don't know if you've seen this before in your study of the word of God, Jesus healed lots of people of lots of conditions. Remember when Peter's mother-in-law had a fever and he healed her? Jesus healed leprosy. Jesus healed all kinds of issues. All kinds of issues. He raised the dead. But on this day, when the king of the Jews comes up to Jerusalem and into the temple, 
Matthew wants to mention two categories specifically, the blind and the lame. What is this all about? Well, if you know Matthew, you know he's an Old Testament scholar. He's always quoting the Old Testament or alluding to the Old Testament. What is this all about, the blind and the lame? Why are they mentioned here now? Well, Matthew is quoting from 2 Samuel 5, or alluding, I should say, to 2 Samuel 5, because the first time the king of the Jews came up into Jerusalem, it was a very different affair. David had become king. He had been persecuted by Saul and ultimately became king. And as he becomes king over not only the southern kingdom but over all of Israel, he decides to go up into Jerusalem. Listen to this account and see if you can agree that Matthew is alluding to this and showing that Jesus is even greater than David. This comes from 2 Samuel 5. You can turn there in your copy of the Word of God if you like. 2 Samuel 5, let me begin at verse 1. It says, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the millow inward. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. It's a very interesting account from the life of David, the king, and now as Jesus comes into Israel, into Jerusalem, he's hailed as the son of David. Jerusalem is an amazing place. I hope you're able to visit there someday. I hope I am as well. But in the meantime, it's amazing that this is a real place. You can go there on Google Earth or Google Maps. You can see the city of Jerusalem. It is a city that is always spoken of as a city you go up to because of its elevated situation. It is a very good city for defending, at least in antiquity, in the time of David. And the inhabitants of the land, the Jebusites who are related to the Canaanites, they had held on to Jerusalem through all the time of the Exodus and the time of Joshua and the judges and the time of Saul. And they remained there. But David wanted to attack and their mockery of David said, you, even blind and lame people could keep you out. But they didn't. David did go and take the city. But now what Matthew is doing, I believe, and see if you agree, I think he's showing us that Jesus, as he comes into Jerusalem, as Jesus goes up into the city in humility, not in war, not attacking, but presenting himself as the true king of Israel in fulfillment of prophecy, he will deal differently with the blind and the lame. He doesn't call for attacks on the blind and the lame, but he welcomes them and he heals them. This is his amazing power. You'd have to picture what it's like to be blind or to be lame, to imagine how incredibly wonderful it was for Jesus to heal you. I remember hearing the story of a man who was healed of blindness through modern medicine. We thank God for modern medicine. God gives us the gift of modern medicine. We thank God for it, again, especially in this season we're in. But a man was healed of blindness through modern medicine, and he was interviewed about the experience. He said, wow, I have to tell you, yellow is just so amazing. What an amazing color is yellow. 
That's the experience of the blind and the lame. Oh, we, we saw in the book of Acts and, and uh, this amazing account of one who was healed of being lame and he's praising and leaping for joy having been healed. This is the power of Jesus Christ. He heals the blind and the lame. Behold this amazing power. Notice too that he has power over frauds and pretenders to authority. He's not intimidated when it comes to the religious leaders of Jerusalem at this time. The events that are unfolding have caught the attention of the religious leaders and Jesus is essentially welcomed by the poor, by those who are walking up to Jerusalem for Passover. Jesus is welcomed by them, but the religious leaders are threatened by Jesus. They don't like what's happening here. They're convicted and they, they want him gone. And they are galled by what happens when even children are in the temple and they're crying out, shouting, rejoicing, Hosanna to the son of David. We see in verse 15, these religious leaders were indignant indignant they say to Jesus in verse 16 do you hear what they are saying can you shut these children up that's not right for them to say this they should only say that about the Messiah the real king of the Jews they shouldn't say it about you do you hear what they are saying what's striking in this text and you'll think, of, think about it with me together so often when Jesus is asked a question, how does he respond? He responds with a question. He responds with a question. In fact, he'll end with a question. But this is one of the sweetest, most succinct responses of our Lord Jesus that we see in Scripture. Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus says. John Piper points out it's in the Greek, it's just simple nigh, the Greek word for yes, yes. I'm okay with that. It's right that they say that. It's true. I am the son of David. I am the king of the Jews. To say it's not true would be a lie. Yes. See, that's his power. He's not insecure. You and I sometimes don't know how to take it when someone says something true about us, about something we did. We don't know if we should say thank you or not or how to respond, but Jesus simply replies, yes, I hear what they're saying, and yes, I'm okay with that. It's right. But then he turns the table on them and says this, have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And it's a mic drop. It's a moment of truth. It's a moment where again in his mercy, Jesus is calling them to repent from their arrogance and pride and turn away and rejoice in the fact that God calls for praises to come from the mouth of little children. There may be little children listening to this live stream or watching. Do you know that God is pleased to hear you say, praise the Lord, praise Jesus, give him your praises, shout your hosannas. Years ago, it was more common in churches and I called yesterday, there are no palm branches at the place I would normally get flowers, but we would have palm branches and we would, we would remember on this day that he was welcomed into Jerusalem. Now things will go sideways and things will become difficult because his ultimate purpose will be fulfilled. He is the king of the Jews and he's rightly welcomed into the city, but only partially so. The official leadership will not welcome him. In fact, in the end, as they stand before the Roman government, they issue this horrific phrase, we have no king but Caesar. The official leadership will reject him, but he is received on this day, and we see his power here. Let us think how we might apply a text like this. It's such a beautiful text. You are deeply impressed in a text like this with how amazing Jesus is. First of all, let's worship him. Let's worship him. Let's acknowledge like the children, like the people, that he is who he says he is. He is the son of God. He is the son of David. He is the one who comes to redeem us. 
He's like David in his solitary combat. You remember that David, before he was king, faced the main enemy of the people of God in one-on-one combat. And that victory that David won was a victory for all the people of God. Jesus will do that for you and me. He will face now in solitary combat the enemy of our souls. The thing that stands between us, he'll face sin and death for us. He will bear all the punishment. When David stepped into that combat, it was Goliath that died. As Jesus steps into this combat, he himself will die. He will shed his blood. His body will be lifeless and placed in a borrowed tomb. And he will rise again. And we'll remember that next Sunday as we come to Easter. But let us worship him. Let us indeed crown him with many crowns. He is the Lord of glory, the Savior of all who come to him in faith. Every one of us who have come to him in faith, he's our Savior, he's our Lord, he's our King. Let us worship him and acknowledge him. I may have shared before, but I was struck by one of the scenes in the book Ivanhoe when there are a band of men who are with a figure like Robin Hood in the woods. These men are men of action, men of decisiveness, great warriors, great fighters with the bow and the arrow. And they've been exposed to a man who's known as the Black Knight. He's a man who's unknown to them. He's quite a warrior. They are aware that at the moment, the true king, as far as they know, is in exile, having been captured. And the king's younger brother is a usurper and is doing things that the king wouldn't want done. And there comes a moment in this beautiful scene in the woods as all these men are gathered around him. The black knight removes his helmet and it becomes clear he is Richard Cor de Leon, Richard the Lionhearted, Richard the King. And what's amazing, all of them kneel in his presence and affirm him as king. Let us do that in our hearts as we see Jesus revealed as king. Let us kneel before him in our hearts and even perhaps Uh, As we come to prayer later in the day, let us kneel before him and worship him and receive him as king of our lives, king of this world. He is worthy of our praise. And let us follow him. What difficult times we find ourselves in, but, but we are not left without good leadership. We can follow Christ. He's full of purpose. He's full of humility. He's full of power through the Holy Spirit. We can follow him. Our president has advised these will be weeks of suffering for our country. This disease will apparently get worse before it gets better. There will be thousands of deaths, millions of cases in our country and around the world. These are weeks of suffering. Christ is familiar with suffering. And we as his followers can be purposeful as we follow him. I was struck this morning. I was listening to a broadcast with... um, Several members of the clergy, a rabbi and an imam and a pastor. There was sort of a community broadcast going on. And I was reminded this is, of course, his Passover week. It's Passover week. And this, in fact, is why Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. He's going up to celebrate Passover and to become the fulfillment of Passover. And I was reminded of something that we may have lost sight of in these days, that that the Lord God Almighty in redeeming his people called for all of them to go into their houses and stay there and to put blood on the doorposts, on the top and the sides of the door and to stay in the houses because the angel of death was coming through. And it says in Exodus chapter 12, uh, verse 22, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will strike, the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. It's okay that we have to be in our houses sometimes. God has purposes and we can trust him in these times. We can follow Christ with purpose as suffering is approaching. Lastly, let me encourage us to remember him. This is the first Sunday of the month. Under normal circumstances, we would be gathering around the table. We would be partaking of the bread and the cup together. And we would delight in that, to remember the Lord. In fact, if we think about it, we might be struck by the fact that of the things Jesus asked to remember, this is 
perhaps the main thing he asks us to remember. He says, do this in remembrance of me. This event that is commemorated in communion takes place on Thursday of this week in the life of the Lord, what we call Maundy Thursday, the, the, the night of the mandate given to the, to the disciples to love one another as Christ has loved us. So let us remember him. Now we can't gather now for sharing the bread and the cup, but we can gather with our families, with our loved ones, perhaps as the ancient Hebrews did in their homes at Passover, we can gather and we can remember the Lord and not forget him, not forget that his body was given for us, that his blood was shed, we can remember him. Remember the humble king, remember his purpose, his gentleness, his power. And in light of that, not be afraid, whatever may come. We've always known death was coming for all of us. None of us gets out of here alive. Some of us will be alive and remain till the time the Lord comes and receives us in the air. We've always known death was coming, but something about this moment makes it feel especially real. This is real. But we are encouraged to embrace the king as he approaches. Embrace him, see his purpose, his gentleness, his power. Let us pray now. Father, we thank you so much for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is full of purpose, full of humility, full of power. He's not outsmarted, he's not outdone, he's not outwitted. The purposes of God are unfolding and our redemption will indeed occur in this week of the life of our Lord. We thank you, we praise you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for being with us now that we can know you will never leave us nor forsake us. May we be strengthened by the truth of your word and the fellowship of one another on this day, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.